DNA dietary analysis is a non-invasive tool to identify the food consumed by vertebrates. This is achieved by identifying prey DNA in their scouts. This technique is especially useful for marine vertebrates such as seals and seabirds as the feeding events are at sea and cannot be easily observed. Fortunately, during the breeding season, these species must return to land to raise young, making them more accessible to researchers. During this time, they're very good at projecting diet data around their colonies and nest sites in the form of poo. These colonies can be remote, often making them difficult and expensive to access. So we want to ensure the samples we collect are of high quality and contain sufficient diet information as returning to these sites again often isn't possible. We developed field collection protocols for vertebrate scats, which were developed and optimised using Shire Albatross in Australia. There are many considerations to make before commencing a study using DNA methods, and these will largely depend on the aims of the study. You'll need to consider which genetic markers or primer sets you'll need to address these aims and determine how and when the sample should be collected. Broadly speaking, two approaches are used for diet analysis. There's group specific primers, which provide high taxonomic resolution of a specific prey group, such as fish or cephalopods. However, they don't allow all prey groups to be detected. If this is required, a universal primer is needed to identify all food groups. However, this primer identifies all eukaryotes, which means that non-food DNA is also detected. Vertebrate scats contain the food DNA you are targeting, but also DNA from the consumer, parasites, and unicellular organisms found in the gut. External contamination may come from the vegetation or the dirt the sample landed on, and insects may feed or lay eggs on the sample. There is also potentially handling contamination from us humans. Using Shire Albatross scat samples, we tested how to minimise the collection of non-food DNA in the sample and increase the detection of food DNA using universal primers. The following variables were explored. Sample freshness, collection substrate, breeding stage, and the developmental stage of the animal. For example, can you collect from chicks and adults in seabirds? Firstly, sample freshness. Most field sites are far from ideal lab conditions with strong winds, heavy rain, and in the higher latitudes, blizzards being common occurrences. These exposed sites also experience high levels of UV. All of these factors can degrade the DNA in scat samples. Our study found that fresh samples where the bird is seen defecating enable the highest detection of food DNA. Recent samples where the sample was still wet but the deed hadn't been seen done, still contained some food DNA, but larger sample sizes would be needed. Avoid any dry samples or those that are starting to form a skin. These samples were found to be more degraded and contain more contamination from insects and fungal growth. Therefore, the amount of food DNA was minimal. Scat samples may land on a range of substrates, which could contain unwanted DNA that can contaminate the samples. We found that collection from rock surfaces yielded the best results as there was minimal contamination from other DNA. Whereas samples collected from dirt had high proportions of unicellular organisms and samples which fell on vegetation were overwhelmed by plant DNA. If you're collecting samples from dirt or vegetation, try and minimize the collection of soil or plant in the sample. If the study animal is a herbivore, ensure you record any vegetation substrate species to ensure the DNA is correctly attributed as food or contamination. We found that incubating birds which have been fasting for extended periods at the nest had minimal food DNA in their scats. Birds that have been at the nest for greater than 24 hours contained almost exclusively parasite and bird DNA. However, birds back for less than 24 hours had high proportions of food in their scats. Ideally target animals with minimal time since feeding by watching those that have just returned from foraging. This may involve watching nests for incubation changes, or for some species, waiting at known access routes and watching animals as they return from feeding. Overall, where possible, avoid any animals known to have been fasting. This includes those building and defending nests. The colour of plumage can also be a good indication of how long they've been ashore. In our study on shy albatross, scats from young chicks still being brooded had less food DNA than older chicks or adults. Instead, samples had a high proportion of consumer or bird DNA. Food is likely to be partially digested, 
prior to feeding by regurgitation and parental DNA is also likely to be transferred, which might explain the high bird DNA proportions found. Ideally, target animals that are directly feeding themselves, or if this isn't possible, target larger individuals if they're young animals. In summary, to get high quality dietary data from scat samples, try to collect fresh scats when the animal is seen defecating, otherwise target wet samples. Be mindful of contamination and minimise the collection of dirt or vegetation in the sample. Collect scats from animals with minimal time since feeding and avoid fasting animals. Avoid young animals that have not fed directly themselves, for example those fed by regurgitation, or instead target larger, older individuals or adults. And finally, keep collection protocols consistent between sites so that dietary data is comparable.